sword with a smaller guard. Is that a thing that makes fighting hard? If you have a shield, you'll be fine. To understand how, let's go back in time. Today, we'll discuss first millennium swords from migration to Viking times, thus the early medieval period. Hello again everyone, Lauren here, and today we're going to talk about some early medieval swords. And when we talk about early, I don't mean um, 11th, 12th century, I mean earlier. So let's define what that means. You're going to say, oh, Viking sword, are you talking about Viking stuff? Well, yes, but also not just Viking stuff. I mean, first thing we have to understand is Viking is a job, it's not a culture. Um, Norse, Scandinavian. Danes? <laughs> Depends on where you are. But we also want to talk about Anglo-Saxons. I mean, they come from a similar place. They're going to have similar, similar technology. Their arms and armor are going to have similar designs. So we could easily say that with a few little modifications in how this looks, it could be an Anglo-Saxon sword. Um, there will be swords of similar style, Frankish, so from uh, the parts of France and Merovingians and uh, Carolingians and even going far into Eastern Europe, we're going to see this simple guard, which is much smaller than the guards on the later medieval swords we've seen. We're going to see very different type of pommel. We're going to see this bar. This one has lobes. And there's a whole classification system for the types of pommels, and there are all sorts of designs, one with a little ring set into it. Some are just a flat bar, and it depends on where we look. But all across Europe, there's a similar style of sword, and we're looking about four or five hundred... Um, of the common era up until about 1000. By 1000 we're going to start to see guards get a bit longer. Now why would you fight with a sword that has a smaller guard? Well the sword itself a little different in the blade type. Doesn't narrow quite so much so the width at the guard down to the tip there's not that much change. It's a little bit of change. Fullers very important for reducing the weight of the sword keeping them strong while reducing their weight, particularly if they are not made of steel. Now, there are examples of steel swords. There's trading um, all the way down to Syria. We know that metal comes from other parts. We know that there's pattern welding in order to make swords stronger. We know that there's accidental adding of animal bones and charcoal and things, which creates steel because it's all about carbon content. We have a slightly fancier sword here. Most people just call these Viking swords, but it is going to range a lot further from just Scandinavian peoples. So we usually look at migration area and Viking age, and these are similar connected things. I mean, Vikings is really just in the end of people migrating for new lands, not just about raiding. So we have Anglo-Saxons, and we'll have... Um, we can t even go back in time to the fall of Rome, and we can talk about Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Huns, and they're going to have these swords where the blade is getting longer from what was used in Rome. I mean some Roman swords were longer, spathas, and as we get to this period we're getting these now about 30 centimeter long blades, approaching a meter for the length of the blade. The grip should fit your hand comfortably. There shouldn't actually, probably could be a little bit smaller for my hand, but this will fit a normal size hand since I have slightly small hands. And it shouldn't need a lot of room. Now people will say, oh, they must have had small hands. Well, early swords were meant to be gripped and had you quite locked in. You can shift your grip. You can have a handshake grip when your thumb is pointed. You can have a hammer fisted grip. These are terms we use today, of course, to explain that there are different ways to hold the sword, but you really want the sword to stay in your palm and if you're hitting and especially if you're hitting into someone's shield and there's that shock that impact you don't want your hand sliding off you want it to be in place so there we go so a sword should fit your hand quite well particularly in this migration through viking period and you're going to notice that you know we have the lobes but some swords and some Im images it's just a bar it's two bars on either side to help the hand stay in place. So that's one thing that the guard does. We know guards and pommels keep your hand on your grip. We learned about that in previous videos where we talked about medieval swords, but this early stuff, well, 
There we go. That's the basic design concept. Now, why would you have just this little guard? Ooh, isn't a guard useful for protecting your hand? Well, we wouldn't need a guard if we had something else to help defend us. Then we know from sword and buckler, we can protect our hands. So, if the camera can keep up the focus with me. There we go. If you're using a shield, then you don't really need a guard when your shield is this big. As you're fighting, and you're attacking, the shield is going to come in. So remember from our sword and buckler, how the buckler covered to protect the hand? Well, when you have big shields, like you do for Anglo-Saxons and Vikings and other cultures uh, from the very early medieval period, that shield can help protect. So when you have a large shield, you don't really need as much hand protection because you're using this for most of your defense as well as some attacks. But you're trying to bash into the other person's shield, trying to gain an opening, attack with the sword, defend, and there goes the focus again. <laughs> We're going to do a whole other video on shields because there's a lot to talk about. Shields, they're made of wood, they might be covered with canvas or hide or leather. Planks and gluing and laminations and shield bosses. We know a little bit about the basics of shields from our sword and buckler videos, but just so we're seeing, these swords don't really have hand guards. You don't need them if you have such a large shield. Eventually, shields get smaller. And that's because there's more armor. Now, we're looking at a time when even the sword is not common. Okay, a sword is a fancy thing. And if you don't have the resources to make hundreds of them, you know, every year, well, you will probably have armaments more like axes and spears and long knives. Because making a sword and keeping this length and keeping the metal in good quality so that it's not going to break, well... We're going back over a thousand years then there's a lot more to it you don't have the same metallurgy you don't have the same processes you don't have the same understanding just yet so swords are different but that's where pattern welding comes in so you may have heard of pattern welding sometimes people call this damascus now it's really hard to see but i'm going to try and get in close and see you can see that there's almost like little marks and waves it's definitely a different texture from this modern steel blade. So what you do is you have alternating layers of better iron into, that's got some carbon to make steel, and you've got lower quality stuff, and you fold them all together, and you have this pattern that comes out at the end of the process. And we'll get into the full process of smithing the sword. Some of you will know that. Some of you, well, there are lots of great videos on YouTube I'm sure you can find about how you can you, you know, use certain etching acids and things to bring out the final pattern on a blade. Incidentally, this sword I've had for about 11 years. This was an impulse buy and I normally don't do impulse buys, but shocked everyone who knew me when I bought the sword and they said, why did you buy, you bought this Viking sword? And it's like, yeah, well, it was only $400, which seems like a lot of money 11 years ago. What a time when the regular price of this was $800. I don't know, I just couldn't pass it up. I really didn't know too much about swords 11 years ago, 10 years ago is when I started learning lots about them, but it was a good find. So this is a sharp sword. You'll notice that these earlier swords, this is a good one to look at because we can see the width at the guard. It doesn't narrow too much coming towards the point. And the point is not quite that sharp. These aren't really big for thrusting sword. You can still thrust with them with this kind of point. But why aren't they so good at thrusting? Well, because also there's not a lot of armor. When we have this gap, this period between the fall of Rome and the high Middle Ages where, you know, you've got a lot of towns really being built up again, people aren't wearing a lot of armor. The shield, a big round shield, is what your defense is. And so you might have a helm, you might have a shield, and you might have an axe or a spear, or a long knife. So if you were using a sword, you probably aren't going to come up against a lot of armor. You're just trying to get around the shield, and you can do a lot of cutting, because you're not going to have that armor to get in the way. 
you'll have clothes and you want to slice through the fabric of the clothing to get through to the person. And if you did thrust, well, they're not going to be wearing a lot of armor. There is male armor, but chainmail tends to be the exception rather than a rule. As we get into the 11th century, then enough has built up. And of course, sword designs will change by then. The blades can be recycled. You can take the sword apart. You can um, dismount the hilt. You can take all the pieces apart and you can rehilt it. You could have a longer guard. And we start to see the guards get a bit longer and longer. And that's where we also start to see some shield design changes and we get the kite shield coming in. There's a lot more going on. Remember, history isn't this happened here and it was static and then things just magically changed. Things don't just come out of nowhere. It's not Athena popping out of Zeus's head fully formed. And that's, uh, you know, ideas are transitional. They evolve over time. And that is always the challenge of history is to say, I have this thing. How did this thing get to that thing? And that thing just doesn't come apart about there is a progression. So it's just a little look at these swords. So we look at earlier swords, definitely meant for cutting, slashing, hacking in to the opponent, and not so much for thrusting, although if you have an opponent who doesn't have a lot of armor, you can thrust into them. But you notice the design is very different. Very different from other swords we've looked at. Very different from the swords that I have displayed next to me here with round or scent stopper pommels, long cross guards, long blades. The metallurgy has to advance. The design has to advance. The techniques, how you fight, changes. Armor changes that. You know, the quality of material changes all of that. So when we look back in time and we see all these things, we have to understand that it's very different as far as how you make one of these with what materials you have, and then how you fight with it. So fighting style relies heavily on a shield. Like I said, we'll talk about shields in another video, but there we go. So that's just a quick look at what earlier swords looked like. And it's that long, not very tapered blade. We don't really call them broadswords. Um, broadsword is a basket-hilted broadsword, which we see in England and Scotland and in later time after the renaissance that's when we talk about broadswords but we can just still call it an arming sword or we can just call it a sidearm or we can just call it a sword which is all they really did um there's also things about how they carried them baldrics carrying them slung under the shoulder sometimes a little higher up sometimes lower but easy to get in and draw in front and be ready to defend not on backs not on the back because I cannot draw a sword from my back. And at five foot seven, I'm not too much shorter than what a, your Viking would be at that time, you know? And um, I, I can't draw a sword from my back and they don't think they, we have no evidence that they did. But a baldric, which I should build. Yeah, and then having it able to draw in front of your body how they were carried, worn, used. But yeah, just a quick look. So here we go. This is your Viking or Anglo-Saxon era even sword. I mean, these are time periods that cross over, but a lot of these design features, from, again, that bar, this kind of guard, maybe it'd be perfectly flat, maybe it's slightly curved. A lot of European swords from 5th century through into beginning of the 11th century are gonna have this kind of appearance used with shields not a lot of armor unless you were important in which case you probably if you had a sword you'd probably have some armor as well and you would be fighting people who wouldn't have those things and it would give you an advantage but again you're going to rely on your shield a lot so a brief look at an old style of sword anyway thank you very much for tuning in and watching just a little blurred background video today uh remember like Subscribe, notification bell if you want to make sure you see these videos with their clever little rhymes at the opening. And uh, I hope that you all have a fantastic, wonderful day. Take care.